It's time for Reason. If you can put it on the ballot and if you can get 51% of naive, ignorant individuals to not understand the purpose of the Second Amendment, to not understand the purpose of shooting a gun, to not understand the role of what having a gun or a militia is all about, to understand what, to understand the background check process. You don't understand because you've never done it. To have that much of a voice, it is the blind leading the blind. This is the Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier. Then I'll get on my knees and pray. Welcome to the Voice of Reason, broadcasting live out of the heart of the nation here in Wichita, Kansas, on the Big Talker KQAM, simulcasting on KGBT-TV, channel 2610, and broadcasting across the entire Mid-American Network. Welcome aboard. Good morning to you. It is a Thursday. The pre-Friday celebration has officially begun. You finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. This week, by the way, has gone by really fast. I don't know what happened, but this week has gone by extremely fast. We are having way too much fun. There's a lot of information going out, and it's coming out very, very quickly, other than the fact that we're probably about to die anyways. And I mean that. I mean that since we're about to just be wiped out. We're about to be uh, in a thermal nuclear war. Where I mean, China is going to throw out the nuclear option when it comes to trade. They're really upset. We have uh, uh, Kim Jong Un that's still wanting to throw a fit, even though that it's calmed down quite a little bit with President Donald Trump. We have, of course, a fascist nation right now with President Donald Trump wanting to completely oppress individuals that are unlike him. We have craziness throughout the entire world and then of course we see the uh, and of course it's the scary of course really bad scary bad bad. according to the express.com yellowstone volcano yellowstone super volcano about to erupt a life or death prep for super volcano emergency is underway more than 20 police fire and rescue vehicles descend upon the area around yellowstone super volcano this week to prepare for what could be a life or death emergency ladies and gentlemen this is about what we've been talking this is the end of the time now be prepared for yellowstone national park public affairs confirmed that they could be a super volcano eruption imminent and that they were putting themselves through their places and through their paces so that way they'd be ready for any eventuality of what could possibly happen. Going through test runs of what a super volcano eruption would look like and how we properly respond. The model bus crash was simulated for the first time in several years in order to steal emergency workers for a crisis. The geyser that's there that can shoot water up to 300 feet up in the air has been going off lately. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the world is about to end. <laughs> And let me tell you something, it's probably President Donald J. Trump's fault for not caring about climate change nearly as much. If you listen to different celebrities, because they are the experts when it comes to climate change, then earthquakes and volcanoes and all of these things are caused by climate change because we would have allowed fracking and we've allowed oil drilling and natural gas drilling. We've allowed different things to happen to the climate because we don't care about the earth or the climate. And therefore, it is the repercussions of Mother Nature wanting to retaliate against the human species. Good morning to you. It's a great way to wake up that way, isn't it? 316-721-8255. 316-721-TALK. We have the social media up and rolling. We have Facebook Live rolling this morning as well. We great. Uh, we love having you on there. If you want to like it, share it, leave a comment, ask a question, just say good morning. We'd love for you to do so on there. It's a big show, heck of a show today coming up, heck and a half, really. At the bottom of the hour, John Whitmer, state representative for the state of Kansas, will give us the lowdown on the shenanigans, what's uh, happening at the state level for educational funding. We have in the 8 o'clock hour, Genevieve Wood. She is the uh, uh, Senior Communications Advisor for the Heritage Foundation along with the Daily Signal. So I'm looking forward to chatting with her coming up at 8 o'clock today. You're not going to want to miss that one as we talk about the conservative agenda that's been advanced by President Donald Trump that he never gets credit for. And actually, he is way farther along on a conservative agenda that the Heritage Foundation has laid out more so than what Ronald Reagan was at this point in his administration. So we'll talk about that coming up in the third hour. Should be a lot of fun with that one. Until then, though, it's open lines to you. I'd love to hear 
from you at 316-721-8255. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time today on education because we've talked about that for almost a week now, and it's it gets very old very quickly, and it gets very frustrating because uh, we're seeing a little bit of movement, but then the movement in the wrong direction, and then they just change things on a daily basis. I don't want to do that, but ladies and gentlemen, I do have an audio clip. As they were going on day number three of the March and the walkout down in Oklahoma, and now... Ladies and gentlemen, they're upset. They're fired up. They are ready to change things now. They are ready to be done with things right now. They don't want to take it anymore. And as they chanted yesterday, we're not going to take it anymore. (laughs) There you go. The bands of Oklahoma's high schools... Marching, chanting, singing at the state capitol in Oklahoma yesterday. Sick and tired of the lack of funding for education and teacher salaries. We're not going to take it anymore. Play it for me. It's so beautiful. What else you got? It. There you go. It is a, that head tip to KSL Channel 5 TV down in Oklahoma with the protests happening at yesterday. Continuing on down in Oklahoma trying to fight for those better salaries. And they're not going to take those low wages any longer. They're not going to support those evil, terrible Republicans. They just do not care about them in any way, shape, or form any longer. They will not have it. They will not do it. And they will not take any more. And they have to sing about it as well. Let me tell you something, though. They did a pretty good job with that. They did a pretty good job with that. I think that their band was actually doing relatively well without the funds, right? I mean, come on. They they were actually able to do a relatively good job performing at the state capitol on a whim without a whole lot of practice, and they did that with the lower funding for the music department. So I th- <laughs> I think they're going to be all right. I think they're going to be all right. The protests continuing on. The Republicans wanting to continue order when it comes to the state capitol in Oklahoma and the Democrats wanting to actually bring up a stop and cease and freeze whatever they're doing with the normal agenda and wanting to bring up tax hikes across the board. There's a, there's a couple of different options they're, they're working on. We'll keep you apprised as they continue to uh, pull their shenanigans in Oklahoma. 316-721-8255. The main point that I wanted to bring up this morning, it was an interesting piece out of the marketwatch.com as how many people, how many of you actually have gone to the doctor in the last, oh, let's say, month or two? Month, two months? How many have gone to the doctor for a, maybe a regular routine checkup, maybe for uh, a specific reason, maybe because you weren't feeling well, maybe you actually had something wrong, maybe you had some tests that you had to do? Have you gone to the doctor? Because according to marketwatch.com, between a third and a half of people between the age of 45 to 59, usually an age where you start going to the doctor a little more frequently as you get a little bit older. I'm not saying you're old, but as you uh, are going through and uh, you're starting to get towards close to the maybe the retirement age, or maybe you're just starting to slow down just a little bit more the age 45 to 59, you would think... You'd be going to the doctor just a little more frequently than maybe when you were 20 years old. Uh, But a third to a half of people age 45 to 59 and a quarter of those, 25 percent of those 60 plus went without needed health care in the past year due to the cost of health care. Now, let me ask you something in a nation like the United States where we had the Barack Obama nice government run health care we had obamacare we had wonderful things happen when it comes to health care right i mean we just got it socialized we were able to raise taxes for everybody we were able to subsidize everything we were able to create a wonderful program called obamacare i'm saying that tongue-in-cheek but you know what i'm saying i thought the costs were going to go down i thought people were actually going to be able to afford it I thought people were actually going to be able to go to the doctor more so because we wanted to be like Europe to where they go to the doctor for every little tiny thing and every little cough and every little sneeze and every little boo-boo that they had. And then the doctor can treat them and it's not going to cost anything to them because it's going to be subsidized through the government and through high taxes. I thought 
that's what was going to happen. And Bernie Sanders has been advocating for that as well. So we go halfway down that road, and it doesn't get better. It gets worse. The cost is astronomical, and we've talked about health care for a long time, socialized health care. We've talked about Obamacare. We've talked about Medicaid expansion. Thank God that discussion's kind of died off at the state level in the state of Kansas right now. I did see a piece where the Democrats tried to bring it back up, and it got shut down just like that. That's a good thing. Because how many people actually want socialized health care? And if you do, are you insane? Where the costs have gone up, and now almost a half of people of the age of 45 to 59 and over 25% of individuals 60-plus went without health care needs Last year, well, they needed it. They didn't go to the doctor last year due to the cost. Age 45 to 59, skipping health care. 49% didn't go to the doctor last year when they were sick or injured. 45% skipped a recommended medical test or treatment. 43% didn't go to a dentist when they were needing treatment. 40% went without a routine physical or other preventative health care. 30, uh, 30% didn't fill a prescription or took less than the prescribed dose of medicine. Why? Because it's too damn expensive. And that's supposed to be the cue to say, let's go further down this road, right? That's supposed to be the cue that says, let's go ahead and let's start going further down Obamacare. Let's go to the socialized Bernie Sanders type of health care or the Hillary Clinton style health care. Let's go down that road even further because already half the people that actually needed treatment didn't get the treatment that they actually needed. Is this the wake up call that we're going to see? Maybe if the super volcano goes off in, in Yellowstone... And the entire country's covered in, covered in ash, and everybody gets sick from that. Maybe that'll force them to go to the doctor, and then we can start advocating for more socialized health care, right? I see it coming, ladies and gentlemen. The end is near. The Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier on the Mid-America Network. past the hour welcome back into the voice of reason it is a thursday the pre-friday celebration rolls right along get you started off for the day welcome aboard better than a cup of coffee a shot of espresso even an energy drink it does not matter let's get you pumped up ready for the day carpe diem all over this place baby that's the way we roll today on a thursday oh let's do it come on i'm feeling it that's right we're done we ain't taking it no more Six seven two one eighty five five three one six seven two one talk. If you want to join into the program, I'd love to hear from you. By the way, speaking of just briefly, when it comes to this in the educational debate here in the state of Kansas, as you know, the five hundred million dollar plan, which we'll actually get more details on in the next segment when we replay our interview with State Representative John Whitmer. Uh, not necessarily five hundred million dollars, but actually more closer to two billion dollars as they do it. Uh, incrementally year over year over year and it's an increase uh, dramatically which means we're going to be raising taxes and it's going to where do we draw the line where where do we finally draw the line and say enough is enough we're sick and tired of education funding we're sick and tired of it continuously every single year increasing the spending increasing our taxes increasing control increasing the whatever we're tired of it we're sick of, where do we draw that line now, some of the governor's candidates have come out and made a statement on this, and Chris Kobach has come out and said, yeah, no, I do not support this bill. It's insane. We don't need to be raising taxes nor be raising any more spending. Governor Collier, on the other hand, who is running for governor as well this fall, had come out and said that he would support this plan if it ends up getting to his desk. So we're already beginning to see a bit of these divisions when it comes to the Republican Party, even in the state of Kansas right now, is some saying, uh, you know what, we got to draw the line somewhere. It's about time that we finally draw the line. The current governor, Governor Jeff Collier, saying, hey, you know what, uh, we got to do something and get it to my desk and we'll make sure it gets signed. So a bit of a difference on that one. Now, the good news is, is that we also talked about the Kansas constitutional amendment to try and 
uh, protect ourselves from the Kansas Supreme Court, be able to put the power back into the legislature when it comes to funding, when it comes to the formula, and when it comes to the power of sending money to the school districts and the Senate now. And i got to give credit to uh, Senate President Susan Weigel for this one, as uh, she is supported along with many other Republicans in the state Senate right now, saying that they will not look at a bill for educational funding until they pass a constitutional amendment. Which is a good piece of news because the Senate is the really tough one with a little bit narrow of a margin. Now, the House could still screw it up a little bit if they pass something in the Senate, but... If it's passed in the Senate, it's going to be, in my opinion, a little more easy and a little more likely to pass something in the House once that's done. So we get something done with the Constitution. This is how compromise works. And this is how we can do this. We pass an amendment for the constitutional amendment. We say that we're not going to even touch educational funding until we do a constitutional amendment. We pass that in both chambers with the three quarters, by the way, because it's a constitutional amendment. We get it signed by the governor. We get that into place. Then we look at the funding. And instead of doing this bill like the $500 million incrementally that really adds up to close to $2 billion, which they end up admitting by the end of the day, then we say, hey, all right, we already got it. Now let's start rewriting our formula. That's our compromise this time. We're not compromising. We're not wavering. We are not the mushy middle this time anymore. We're not going to do that. We've been doing that for how long now? 30, 40 years? We've been doing this for how many years for the, for the Montoy case, for the Gannon case? How many years have we as conservatives and Republicans been compromising to give and give? And, all right, if we just do it this one more time, it'll be all said and done and it'll, it'll be fixed. If we just do it this one more time, it'll be all done and we don't have to worry about it again. Oh, uh, you know what? They still want more. If we want to do it one more time or the schools will shut down and we'll never have education ever again, ever. And that's the argument that we usually hear. So we end up giving in or we just get overridden and we don't have enough voices in there. This is the time where we stand our ground. We draw the line in the sand and say, not only will we do a constitutional amendment to shut down the Supreme Court from these decisions, but we will also start rewriting the formula thereafter. And we don't have to give another penny to education. We just have to appropriate the money the way we need to. And that's really what we need to be doing. 316-721-8255. This is the year that we can make it happen. And if they don't, We have elections coming up in November. Hint, hint, wink, wink. We have elections coming up to where we can really draw that line. We can stand our ground, and we can actually make a firm stance with the number of individuals that we elect that actually have that same kind of like-minded ideas. We can do this. We can do this. I know I kind of poke fun at a little bit. I know that I rail on this a little bit, and I know that we focus a lot of time and energy on this, and I don't want to do that a whole lot more per se, especially for today, but at the same time, we need to be aware of the opportunities you and I have, what the situation currently is in Oklahoma and in Kansas, and then what we can do to actually fix that. Now, I understand the situations are a bit different, but we just read the editorial piece a day or two ago to where many of the legislators in the state of Kansas are now advocating, or the teachers union in the state of Kansas now advocating for, oh, look, there's teachers walking out in Oklahoma. Look at that. We could probably do the same thing because we can't force the state treasurer to not sign the checks to the state or to the school districts, which means we can't technically shut down the schools, which means the only way we really can shut down the schools and we have the power to do so is to rally the teachers in the teachers union and and force them to walk out of the classroom and protest the same way and shut it down on our own accord. I guarantee you that that if they end up wanting to go down that road, that's what would happen. Let's not give them that power or that ability. Let's stand firm. Let's draw that line in the sand, and let's call out that challenge. It's about time we did so. It's been way too long, and they're not used to that. I don't think they know how to respond if we ended up doing something like that. Bottom of the hour news coming up. Lots more of your phone calls as well. This is The Voice Reason. Stay here. For reason 
If this is a victory for Democrats thinking they have the momentum again, then let them have it. Because that's as far as they're going to go. In a state that was already won by Democrats, already predominantly blue, in a state where the Republican did not want to embrace current Republican trends. If you're not going to do that, then you're not going to win. End of story. It's very simple. This is the Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier. Making it happen today on a Thursday. Welcome in. It's the pre-Friday celebration. Lots to get to today. Lots of fun to be had. Lots of, By the way, hour number two, we're going to be doing an educational class. <laughs> As we talk about some of the education, we're going to talk about some of the classes, and uh, we need to do a professor lecture-ish kind of thing, and we'll do that coming up in hour number two. You're not going to want to miss that. should be a little fun there. 316-721-8255, 316-721-TALK. All right, I want to play an interview we had at yesterday, State Representative John Whitmer. As you know, in the legislature in Kansas right now, up in Topeka, there's been a lot of back and forth, wishy-washy. The bill that was going to fund education, an additional $500 million, so they say, uh, was killed at the beginning of the week or late last week, and then they rose it back up a couple days later. They voted on it. It's at the Senate now. Now the Senate says they won't even look at it or touch it until they talk about a constitutional amendment. We don't know what's going on. There's shenanigans all over the place, and it's happening very, very quickly. So this is State Representative John Whitmer on the latest as of yesterday morning. Uh, in uh, He had just come out of the night before as well, the discussion on the constitutional amendment in their Judiciary Committee. So this is what he had to say right here on The Voice Reason yesterday. State Representative John Whitmer on the line with us, by the way, as well. John, how are you, my friend? Well... You know, we haven't raised your taxes this week. <laughs> this so, week. This, this week. week. The last couple of days have been absolutely nuts in Topeka. We saw this bill, which you can elaborate some of the details on. The media reports it is a $500 million in additional funding for education, $100 million over the next five years. And uh, the Republicans were the ones that created this and that it was the negotiation. Governor Collier said, yeah, let's make this happen. This is fantastic. Get it to my desk. It died. And then all of a sudden, apparently, we felt like reviving it yesterday and passing it and sending it to the Senate. What's going on up there? Well, you know, um, it's funny because Fred Patton, who, who's a friend of mine, and uh, he, he jokes because I keep insisting on what he calls Whitmer math. Um, <laughs> and, and, and finally, yesterday, I, I, I kind of got a little frustrated with him because I told him it's not Whitmer math, it's the reality math. Ah. And, and that is that, you know, we have to be honest with the people who are going to have to pay for this. And so let's, let's be honest with the folks about the true numbers. It's, they say it's 500, but they're not counting the 100 they put in last year for this year. So even if using their numbers, it's actually 627. Very so nice. they, only say, they only say five because that's easier for people to swallow. Sure. But the real number is 627, and that's not even the real number. Here's the Whitmer math. What they do is every year they put in another 100, and that's where they say it's only 500 because it's 100 a year. But it's compounded. So they take 100, and then next year they give you another 100 plus the 100 you got, so that's 2, plus the 100 you got, so that 2 plus 1 is 3. And then the next year you take that 3 plus 100 is 4. And so I consider that cumulative because as I asked Fred, I said, Fred, count it out for me if you would. Imagine each taxpayer is shelling out of their wallet the new math. What does it add up to? And he says, well, technically... It's two billion dollars, but it's really only five hundred. <laughs> and there's your Whitmer math. So, and this so is, the real number is two billion dollars, but it's only five hundred. This is really like what we see with the local school bond issues, to where they say, "I know we already have two or three bonds going, and you're already paying that with your property tax now, but we need a new bond issue, and it's only going to cost you a piece of pizza for every hundred thousand dollars in your home." Right. So right. that way you're not right. paying that much when you're not realizing that you're already paying on two different bonds. And as soon as they expire, then they just renew them for something else. And then they say, well, we need something new, so here's a, here's a fourth bond. And we just continue to pile on while they say, oh, look, it's only a little bit more. It's not really going to matter. Right. And what this is is squirrel. That's exactly what this is. Sure. It's, it's look, don't look at what the other hand is doing. Just just go ahead. And, you know, it's all for the kids. It's all for the children. And, and I get this. Don't get me wrong. I get this. And the point that I have made all along through this process, if we truly had held these districts accountable and we were doing priority-based budgeting and we had them coming in and justifying to the penny how they were spending their money and they made their case and said, look, we need this. The money's going to the classroom, and 
and don't get me wrong, teachers need more pay. Mm -hmm. But if they could come in and they could say our teachers need more money and we are efficiently using every dollar and gosh darn it, we need that money, then, then you know what? I'd vote for that. But they can't make that case. They can't prove it. And we have seen time and time again where you have superintendents or vice superintendents, in the case of Wichita, making 180, 280, 300, 600 thousand dollars a year. You have administrative buildings being built at the tune of 80 million dollars a year. You have aquatic centers at 20 million dollars. And that money's not going into the classroom. So when you have those kinds of expenditures, I find it hard to believe that you can now turn around and justify $2 billion in Whitmer math that the, <laughs> that the taxpayers are going to be on the hook for, and we can't give parole officers and mental health workers and cops and firefighters and corrections officers and other people a pay raise because the K through 12 budget is now expecting to make more and more chunks out of our budget. We've been sweeping money from KDOT for decades, and that's not going to stop. Of course, and at not. some point, this insta- this insanity has to stop. Well, and as you mentioned, where all the money is going with the local school bonds, where the money is being dumped into, then we see when it comes to the teacher salaries, which is what we're seeing with the protests down in Oklahoma right now. We saw it last year when we dumped in the hundred and fifty, two hundred million dollars over the next few years already from last year's budget, where they gave the teachers in the Wichita district at least a three point nine percent raise, and then turned around and gave the superintendent a 6.5% raise that gets them right close to $300,000 a year. Right. The superintendent who'd been on the job for three months sure. when she got that raise. And, you know, had that happened to me, I get it because by her technical definition, she was entitled to that. But, you know, if that's me, I turn around and I donate that to, you know, free and reduced lunch program, or I give that to the... I just, I don't accept it. Sure. The last thing I do is I take that raise. And then, and then two weeks later, what does she do? She hires, her, her, promotes her best friend to a vice superintendent position at $180,000 a year. <laughs> Again, it's just the optics of this. And, the, well, and then we see where the money has been going for the lawsuits to say that this is where the money needs to go from the state government. It, it's the misdirected frustrations at you guys as the legislators as opposed to the local school district. The local school districts, over how many years now for these lawsuits, have, div- have donated and given up your taxpayer money instead of going to the classroom or the teacher, $7.3 million, Wichita being the top number one by a large margin of where that money has actually been coming from to donate to the legal suits to tell the Supreme Court to bully you guys on where the money's supposed to go for education. Well, and that, yeah, I brought that up yesterday. I serve on House Judiciary, and we're currently holding hearings on the proposed constitutional amendment, and I actually brought that up to the lobbyist for the Kansas Association of School Boards. And I said, you know, over the, since 2005, you guys have diverted $7.3 million from the classroom into legal fees, suing the state, suing the taxpayers with taxpayer money for more taxpayer money. And, you know, the, the, my whole contention on this is I've never seen a, a more coerced and coordinated effort to suppress the vote than we've seen here. I'm getting emails all the time. And sadly, uh, just yesterday, I tried to run an amendment on the House floor that would have just said you can't use taxpayer money to sue the taxpayers for more taxpayer money. <laughs> Only 49 members of the House voted in favor of that amendment. And, you know, the whole point of this is you want to sue, go ahead. That's, that's your right. But don't use taxpayer money to do it. And can we, can we include just, something in that? This is a frustration. That, it is a frustration. Can we include that type of wording or that type of phraseology into the constitutional amendment? And I want to ask you, because I know that you guys started talking about that yesterday, how was that meeting? Because that, with all this frustration, that's kind of the beacon of light right now, is can we create a constitutional amendment to get this back on track, to put the Supreme Court in their place, and to fix this formula for funding of education? Well, we can try. I mean, like I said, yesterday we had uh, the first full day of uh, hearings. We had it was four hours worth of. I mean, we had both the proponents and the and the opponents the day before. We had three hours worth of hearings on informational on the history of the lawsuits, on the Constitution itself. So we've had I mean, a lot of of information. Um, I would recommend folks look at Kansas Coalition for Fair Funding. You can look at their they've got Twitter and Facebook, and and you get a whole lot of information. You can actually read the amendment that's being proposed. 
Today we're going to, we've got hearings again today where we will probably spend another three or four hours actually debating and working the bill, working the amendment itself. Um, but, you know, it, essentially what, what we're looking to do with this, this is not, the legislature's not doing this. All the legislature's going to do is propose that the people of Kansas, the people who are paying the bill, and the people who actually wrote this Constitution have the right to, to finally have their say on this. And that's my contention all along. Whether you believe that schools should be funded, whether you think they should have more money, whether you think the court should play a role in this, why not let the folks have their say? Let's put it on the ballot, let the people vote, and if the, if the folks who oppose this are so confident, then why are they so afraid of what the people, what the voters might say? So put it on the ballot, and all, this, all the, the ballot in the constitutional amendment should say is that the legislature that by the constitution has the power of the purse let's just affirm that legislature keeps the control of the money the court should absolutely have the right to weigh in on equity and that should be the amendment there it is there it plain is. and simple put it on there and let the folks have their say i find it ironic that the bill that you guys are talking about right now with the quote-unquote 500 million dollars that actually adds up to close to two billion dollars is exactly the same amount of money that the study that was completely inaccurate, and nobody knew actually where it came from. It actually says that right now with our current funding, we should have close to a 93% graduation rate. That's the requested amount that that study says, and they somehow come up with a bill that actually surprisingly comes up with that exact same number. Amazing. Isn't that fascinating? It, Crazy. I, I just, it's, it's, I'm sure that's purely coincidental. <laughs> Some, someone asked me the other day what I thought of that $200,000 uh, report, and I said, well, it's a $200,000 worth of birdcage liner. So, I mean, that was, that was my take on it. Um, it you know, it, we, the reports are what they are. I think you could – I mean, my take on it has always been, again, uh, until they can prove they're efficiently using the money that they are receiving, I don't see – putting more pressure on the taxpayers to give them more. And I have not seen that proof of efficiency yet. We, I, we, we've seen it time and time again on the larger districts. The smaller districts, I don't see that so much. You know, the districts like Galena and Clearwater, some of these smaller districts, that doesn't seem to be the problem, the sure. rural districts. But when you've got these massive districts, you know, Blue Valley, the seventh wealthiest district in the country, and they're getting free and reduced lunch and poverty ratings? I mean, I, okay, but that's where, I, that's, that's where I struggle. State Representative John Whitmer, that was yesterday here on The Voice Reason. Got to take a break. We'll wrap up this conversation and more when we come back. Stay here. minutes to the top of the hour. Welcome back into the Voice of Reason here on a Thursday. The pre-Friday celebration rolls right along. 316-721-8255. 316-721-TALK. If you want to join in, how many people are on Facebook today? Not the Facebook Live. You can go to the Facebook Live if you'd like to. Facebook.com forward slash 1480 KQAM. You can like it, share it, spread the word, baby. Leave a comment, ask a question. Does not matter. According to CNBC, Facebook said on Wednesday, Mark Zuckerberg meaning, Facebook said that it believes most of its users who have had a specific search function enabled have had their profile data scraped by third parties. We've seen some scraping, according to CEO Mark Zuckerberg. On a call with reporters, I would assume that if you had that setting turned on, that someone at that point would access your would have access to your public information in some way. Trying to avoid the fact that they are responsible. Now, let me ask you. I get it. The fact that (laughs) we're on social media and, yes, information is probably out there for the public. But if you remember way back when, when Facebook kind of just started, Mark Zuckerberg was like, no, don't you worry. Uh, Your your information is going to be protected. Your personal information, your private messages, your whatever. It's going to be protected. You don't need to worry about that. Now, yeah. Now, usually, if you're anything like me, I have a an iPhone, which is unfortunate. I've never had an iPhone in my life until just recently. And honestly, to be honest with you, it's a little frustrating. I I don't like smartphones at all, really. I don't like the technology that much at all. But I have it just for the work-related issues. I can always be doing show prep. I can be communicating with people, scheduling guests, doing things, whatever. 
doesn't matter. The point is, is that if you go into your settings on your phone, you need to turn off the settings that say, yeah, go ahead and track me everywhere I go. Or you need to hit the button that says, please, you know, block the ad busters thing from tracking me or following me. Or please don't report all the different things that I do and that I type and that I say. And please, I mean, you have to turn those settings off because they're automatically defaulted. And I'm assuming, I don't even know where the settings are on Facebook for this, saying that you'd have your personal profile enacted for the specific search function. I don't know what that is. So I'm assuming that it's probably automatically turned on, just like everybody else's, by default, unless you actually know where it is and go in and specifically turn that off, then you're probably being tracked for everything that you're doing on Facebook. <laughs> I guess that's the, the negativity of the beast, per se. Of If you're going to be on there, then just accept the fact that that's usually what's going to go on. So if you have a Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg now saying that, well, you know, we're not really reliable. We just are not really responsible for this. We're not liable in our sense of Facebook because the settings there, all you got to do is turn it on and turn it off. Duh. How many people actually do that? The settings that Zuckerberg referred to is one where users let other users search for them by email address or phone number instead of by name. And that not only is useful for the individuals that are actually searching for people on Facebook by email or by phone number, but businesses as well, because now when that is open and people can search you by that, that means businesses can as well. Not only search for you, but be able to use that information of email and by phone number to be able to track whatever you're doing. Technology is a very tricky thing, and I'm not one that necessarily likes it or actually understands it a whole lot, but it's needed, kind of. When it comes to technology, when it comes to society today, to be able to, especially in media, I mean, being in media, you kind of have to have something like that to be able to get the information out to you, the listener, whether you're on radio, whether you're watching on TV, whether you're trying to stream it live, whether you're watching the Facebook live, I mean, the information needs to be out there. Throughout the day, I like to post stories and pol political stories or links or updates or whatever's going on in the world. And we do that on Facebook. How else would you get that information unless I come on the air throughout the entire day and actually give you that, give that to you. And if you're listening to that. It's a very tricky thing, but at the same time, does do large corporations or the government, because the government's involved in this too, hello, do they have the right to be able to track everything that you're doing? It's kind of a scary thought that nowadays we really don't have any type of privacy. A private conversation you have on the phone, a private conversation maybe you have in your home to where maybe the speaker's on on your phone, emails that you're getting back and forth between colleagues or friends or family or whoever, or whatever the case is, that none of that is private any longer. They know all of it. It's kind of a concerning situation. The good news is, because I always like to leave it on a high note, the good news is, is that now that we're aware of these types of things, watch many different organizations and different social media outlets and different uh, email web hosts or, or whatever they may be online, watch them start changing a lot of that and we start re-isolating ourselves. We can only go so transparent for so long until people say, I like my privacy. I like my privacy. Except for the young generation, maybe, where they said 80% of them kind of like their personal information private, but wouldn't mind giving up their friend's email address to sign up for a free pizza. That's concerning as well. We don't mind giving other people's information out for our benefit. But at the same time, we kind of like to be a little close quartered on ourselves. Hour number two coming up. Lots more to get to today. It's the Voice of Reason. Stay here. It's time for Reason. If you can put it on the ballot and if you can get 51% of naive, ignorant individuals to not understand the purpose of the Second Amendment, to not understand the purpose of shooting a gun, to not understand the role of what having a gun or a militia is all about, to understand what, to understand the background check process. You don't understand because you've never done it. To have that much of a voice, it is the blind leading the blind. This is the Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier. Then I get on my knees. Voice of Reason broadcasting live out of the heart of the nation here in Wichita, Kansas on the Big Talker, 1480 on the AM side, 102.5 the FM side, KQAM, simulcasting on KGBT-TV. Welcome aboard. It's great to have you along today. It is a Thursday. The pre-Friday celebration has officially begun. You see the light at the end 
of the tunnel. It is almost, I mean, come on, we had, hopefully for you, had a shortened weekend last weekend when it came to Easter weekend. Now we see the weekend coming up upon us as well. Maybe we can start seeing some warmer weather. Maybe we can start seeing some nice sunshine. I don't know how many days it's been overcast lately. Yesterday finally started to break up a little bit. Let's see if we can actually have a little bit nicer weather the next few days. Welcome in 316-721-8255, 316-721-TALK. If you want to join in, it is open lines to you for this hour, whatever you want to talk about. You're more than welcome to do so. Coming up in hour number three, I'm really excited to have her. She is the Senior Communications Advisor for the Daily Signal, along with the Heritage Foundation, and it is Genevieve Wood. Looking forward to chatting with her coming up in hour number three, talking about the Trump administration, the agenda of the Heritage Foundation, as you know, the conservative organization out of Washington, D.C. Great organization. Jim DeMint was working with them for the longest time, and they are still continuing on conservatism on a daily basis. So Genevieve Wood, she'll be working with us and uh, chatting with us coming up in hour number three. But this hour, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to go back to school for a minute, right? We need to to sit down in our class. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, sit down in your class, pull out your pencils and papers, and let's get ready to read chapter number five. And as we talk about education throughout the entire state and even down in Oklahoma and across the nation, which has always been an issue, we need to learn about what we're actually learning in the classrooms and especially maybe some of the higher educational places, right? We need to understand. We need to know. We need to to know if our children that are going to higher education or even going through K through 12, what they're learning and what we need to learn. Because have you noticed there are some new words floating around where you go, huh? And you don't quite understand. (laughs) And you don't quite get get the sentence that someone says something, but yet you're not hearing anything that actually makes sense. You don't know what they're saying sometimes. And nowadays, we like to paraphrase things. With texting, we like to shorten phrases. LOL, laugh out loud. That's about the only one that I know because I don't text a whole lot. Or when I do, I usually spell things out, and it's a really, really long thing. But LOL, I do do. I do enjoy the LOL. That's about the best that I go. But they're shortened terms. And there's, it, they actually have classes on these, by the way, online, of young generation individuals trying to teach older individuals the phraseology of of what they actually mean and what these words mean and how to actually use them in sentences because now we're actually relearning how to use the English language. And these words, by the way, are actually starting to be included into the dictionary, which is insane. But now there's a whole brand new slate of them, and they are how we identify ourselves. Yes, pronouns on how we identify ourselves. As you know, there are... At Kansas University, at KU, they actually had the stickers to where you can actually put the pronoun of which you you would prefer to be identified as. So that way, if you don't necessarily identify as a woman or a man or other or an alien being or a cat or whatever, then you can actually put those on your pronoun name tag. So that way, when people address you, you can be referred to the proper pronoun without offending them. And now come to find out there's actually a website to the LGBTQIA, XYZ community, whatever, the the website to where they actually are now giving lessons on how you can use the proper gender neutral pronouns so that way you don't offend anybody. And not only is it on their website, not only are there lecture courses on actually how to do this, kind of like an old English class you would have in the 7th and 8th and ninth, 10th grade, But they're actually being taught in many universities across the nation now, in class, by the professor, accepted into common phrasia, into common dialogue by peers, being included into the Webster's dictionaries. I'm telling you, this is not a joke. This is really big. So, ladies and gentlemen, this morning I figured it was time for us to go back to school for a minute and start learning about what the young, hip kids are talking about these days, right? As your body grows bigger, your mind must flower. It's great to learn. Because knowledge is power. In Schoolhouse Rocky, the chip on the block of your favorite schoolhouse, schoolhouse rock. There we are. So we have our educational class for the day here on The Voice of Reason, and it's time for us to get back in class, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. As you're heading off to work this morning, as you're starting your day, let's pull out your tablets, let's pull out your notepads and paper and pencils, although probably today you just have an iPad or something to where you can type on. Whatever you want to do, it may, even if you type these, it may have the red bar come under it as the misspelled words. 
ignore it because these are legit. And if it does come up, then your notepad is probably racist or bigoted or sexist to some degree. According to the LGBTQRIA whatever resource center online, there are new pronouns called the gender personal gender pronouns, the PGPs, personal gender pronouns. And here, first off, are the frequently asked questions about your PGPs or personal gender pronouns. What if I make a mistake referring to someone? It's okay, they say. Everyone slips up from time to time. The best thing to do if you use the wrong pronoun for someone is to say something right away like, Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I meant whatever pronoun that you meant to say. If you realize you made the mistake after the fact, apologize in private and move on as they recommend. How do I ask someone? Here's the big question. I'm kind of curious about this myself. How do you ask someone what pronoun they actually use? I mean, come on. Everybody's not going to have a nice little sticker on there for their personal pronoun preferred usage. So we need to ask them. And in a large group of people, you don't want to sound like a fool or a buffoon or a bigot or a sexist because that would trigger somebody and then you'd feel really, really bad. So you need to ask them, right? How do we do this? Try asking, what pronouns do you use? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Or you can say, can you remind me of what pronouns you use, please? It's not Stefan, it's Stefan. <laughs> so here it is, ladies and gentlemen. And I think we have the wrong music for this. Let's try this again. Let's do it. Okay, that sounds way better. Here it is. The gender neutral pro uh, pronoun usage in the nation now being taught in college courses, many of them across the nation by college professors, now being included into the Webster's dictionaries across the nation for you as we talk about our gender. No longer, and I mean like no longer his or hers, he or her, uh, his or hers, himself, herself, he, she, none of these. These pronouns are not allowed to be used anywhere because if you say, hey, look at over there, he's a little goofy, then all of a sudden you're now... Uh, bigoted and closed-minded because he may not refer to himself as a he, but as a gender neutral. And we don't want to offend. Or if people are, you know, just identify something else, you can't sometimes technically recognize what they may be. Or the people you hear online that are actually, like, identify as aliens or something. So here it is. There is the list, and I, you can go on website, by the way, and you can find all these, and they not only have the list of pronouns, but you can actually have a guide on a how-to guide on where to actually include all of these pronouns. There are one, two, three, four, five, six variations of the pronoun for each one of these. I'm not going to go through all of them because that would take all day, like a college course. But the six of them are for like a he, she, a he or she, gender neutral, would be a... Zai, Z-I-E, a Sai, S-I-E, an A, E-Y. I think that's what they're going for. A. It starts sounding like a New Yorker. A. What are you doing? E-Y. A Ve, V-E, a Te, T-E-Y, and an E, an E, just an E. I'm, I'm. Guarantee, I promise you this is real. Those are the pronouns that you could replace he or she in a sentence to say zai, say, a, ve, te, or eh. <laughs> there it is. Now, when it comes to the different variations, like a himself or a herself, it would be like a zai, zai self, z i e self. Uh, zai self would actually be converted to herself, not an H-E-R self, but a herself is an H-I-R. Might be higher self, but herself. H-I-R self. Uh, an air self. E-I-R self. A tur self. Tur T-E-R self. <laughs> or an M self, which would be the E. The eh. It would be an M self. E-M self. So, I've created a couple sentences that we could practice on here for a second, so that way we can really understand this. Because remember, this is the classroom. We're on TV. We're on radio right now. This is the classroom. This is a lecture. Here it is. Here's how we can use these boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, on where we can the no's and the yays on where we should be with these gender neutral pronouns. Here's how a normal sentence would look like. He walked to his dorm room to color in his adult coloring book because he was triggered. 
is the sentence. Now, the he walked into his dorm room. Both those he and his's would be out. Uh, in his adult coloring book, because he was triggered, all of those he's and his would all be gone. Here's how the sentence would look like with a gender neutral sentence. Because that one is right out. So you can't use that phrase. You can't use that sentence any longer with he walked to his dorm room to his coloring book because he was triggered. You can't use that anymore. That's done. Here's the correct one. Using a Zai. Zai walked to their dorm room to color in their adult coloring book because Zai was triggered. That would be the appropriate sentence right there. It sounds almost German, ja. Oh, ja, ze, he's, ze walked to his coloring book in the color, ja, because he was very triggered, ja. Oh, it's very good. Here's another one for you. A new sentence. She ate a Tide Pod last night while her friend snorted a condom. <laughs> because apparently that's a new trendy thing today. Uh, she ate... I can't get through these. She ate a Tide Pod last night while her friend snorted a condom. <laughs> she became ill while her friend became pregnant. Uh, that one's right out, ladies and gentlemen. That's that, No, that one's right out. Here's the proper one using the gender-neutral pronoun of Psy. Psy ate a Tide Pod last night while her friend snorted a condom. Psy became ill while Psy's friend became pregnant. That one is the correct one, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it's very good, Psy and Psy. That's what we need to use for these gender-neutral pronouns. <laughs> one more for you. He treated him, he, we got to remember the pronouns here. He treated himself to a marijuana-infused glass of vine. His girlfriend was not pleased with his behavior. That one's no, that one's right out. First off, we're assuming that he has a girlfriend, which is not the case. Uh, also, we cannot be assuming he and himself and his girlfriend. So here's what the proper sentence should actually look like. Using a uh, different gender neutral pronoun, Tay, the T-E-Y, Tay. Here's how you should properly say this now. Because remember, you're going to get called out for this in the general public. Tay treated herself to a marijuana-infused glass of wine. Tem friend of a, not a girlfriend, but of a specifically identified gender that's probably a bigot to a multi-gendered and identifiedness uh, individual was not pleased with Tem behavior. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the best way for you to properly be able to phrase those sentences if you're, whether you're writing them or whether you're actually speaking them in the general public, because that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we're at in society today. Welcome into it. 316-721-8255. Let's go to the phones here, shall we? Good morning. What's your name? Good morning, Andy. It's Ron. Ron, what's happening, my friend? Oh, I was listening, watching that on Tucker Carlson's show last <laughs> night. That was just hilarious. Uh, I, I didn't even see that. I had seen a blurb that this is kind of the new thing, and I had heard about Tucker Carlson's, but I did not watch that. Was that one a pretty good one? Oh, yeah. It was He, he was doing the same thing you were doing with some gal that was, she's a, a real radical left <laughs> that he has on her program. She. I can't remember. She's the publisher of a magazine. Here's the crazy part. This is literally being taught in many college classrooms around the country by professors. These terms, this Zai, Sai, Te, T-E-Y, S-I-E, Z-I-E, these words-ish or collection of letters, let's put it that way, are actually being included into the West, uh, Webster's Dictionary. And now this is going to be the new norm of what many, I mean, how long until we start seeing this in our K-12 through educational system to say, now this is how we refer to as pronouns. Uh, here's a verb, here's a noun, and here's a pronoun so that way we don't trigger anybody or identify them as something that they don't want to be identified as well i always thought that it was a pronoun can we use that uh pr it well i i don't know maybe uh, we'd have to reference the lgbtqia community because that may trigger somebody because then we may be uh using sarcasm to actually identify them and they wouldn't like that very much oh okay yeah well uh, uh are we entering the uh, Ebonics era of uh, LBGT? <laughs> Probably. I mean, we need to have all 26 letters be accounted for for some way, shape, or form. Ron, I love it. I appreciate it, my friend. Uh, I, Yeah, this is where we're at. This makes me very sad. And apparently I'm, I'm going to fail college if I would actually go to college today, which I failed college the first time I tried it anyways. But if I went today, I would really fail because I wouldn't be able to even use my pronouns in a generic, basic English class in college today. Let's go back to the phone, shall we? Good morning. What's your name? Oh, this is Jim. 
Jim, what's happening? Well, I listened to you. I, I may have missed the previous caller. He may have already covered it, but I think the uh, proper way you use that letter Z is zit. Uh, <laughs> it, it describes everything exactly, um, and because uh, you don't want to call somebody it, you know, look, look at it over there. Uh, you know, it's you know. You, it's just confusing. Well, that, well, that's why. That's why we would use the Zai, the Z-I-E. We look at that Zai over there because it wouldn't be look at him over there, look at her over there. It wouldn't be that. It would be Zai. Yeah. So that way we can use it appropriately in that way, no matter what they may feel or identify as, we wouldn't offend them in that sense. Jim, I love it. I appreciate it. I want to squeeze in one more phone call before a break here, shall we? Good morning. What's your name? It's the sign formerly known as Wallace. <laughs> Wallace. Well, uh, Wallace, I could say, you know, you, but then I would probably be offended. You'd probably be offended in some way, too. So I'm going to use, hey, Tay, how are you? No, I'm the, I'm the, I'm like, you know, Prince started all this. Remember when he had the symbol formerly known as Prince? <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of him. So uh, that, I'm, I'm hashtag now. That's what you have to call me is hashtag. Hashtag. Oh. Yeah, there we go. I like that. I like that. <laughs> what is the origin of. Because when you were reading those sentences, I swear you were speaking German or something. That's what I'm saying. That's what. It's just not. I mean, the 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 side that tries to bully individuals and oppress them by saying you must refer to us as, or else you're going to be triggered and we're going to be angry. Does that not sound like a fascist German? Uh, sie walked into the bar and sie had a great uh, the drink because I mean, the, <laughs> the, well, what's, the, what's the origin? Who invented these these words? They were probably head members of the LGBTQ community that just said, let's find random letters that can sound relatively similar so that way we can use these. And then they just patented them them themselves. I don't know where the origins of these came from. Yeah, I got I got Using those words to describe someone, it's it's almost like, uh, you know, when someone uses the word you people, it's, you know, especially when you when you say something to you know, a, a, a you know, a black liberal. They're like, "What do you mean, you people? What, you liberals?" Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. <laughs> These. I, I don't get it. I mean, and if you type these and go into a Word document, go into Microsoft Word and just type in Z-I-E, and I guarantee you, it's probably going to come up with a red bar underneath it and say, can't identify a word, not sure what the hell this is. But then, of course, Microsoft Word is probably racist or sexist or bigoted in that sense, too. Probably. Well, well like you used in your sentence earlier, uh, what was it, the one who was eating Tide Pods and, and skin <laughs> I got to tell you, only from that generation, I don't think I want them lecturing me on my constitutional rights. Which, by the way, let me just, food for thought out there, one of these things that hit me. You know, this whole election, uh, voter ID for election and how it's somehow racist to require an ID to vote because it's targeted at minorities because yes. they don't have IDs. Well, if, if that's an attack on your voting rights and you have to show an ID to purchase a firearm, isn't that an attack on your Second Amendment right, too? Uh, well, of course it is, but they don't see it that way because they want to attack the Second Amendment anyways, and now they're voting to repeal the Second Amendment, the same ones that are probably eating Tide Pods. Wallace, I love it. I appreciate it, my friend. Got to take a break. 25 minutes past the hour. This is The Voice of Reason. The Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier on The Big Talker, KQAM. Welcome back into the Voice of Reason. Went a little long in that last segment. We love all the phone calls. Lots more coming up. Bottom of the hour news coming up. When we come back, we'll touch on this some more and we'll shift gears a little bit. I, Zai, meaning myself, Zai needs to take a break. We'll be right back. Line just isn't enough. Is that all you got? It's time to wake up the right way. All right, all right, all right. This is the Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier. Welcome on the it. Big Talker, 1480 AM and 1025 FM, KQAM. There it is, broadcasting out of here on the Big Talker, KQAM. We love having you aboard. Welcome on a Thursday, the pre Friday celebration, making it happen better than a cup of coffee, a shot of espresso, even an energy drink, whatever you may do in the morning to get you pumped up, ready to go for the day. This has got to be on the top of the list for you because, heck, I don't know any other excitement that happens at 7 o'clock in the morning like this. 316-721-8255, 316-721-TALK. If you want to join in, newsman Rick Everett in studio. And uh, now I went through, 
Uh, there's been a lot of news today. It's been a lot. Of, it's well, not news, but political issues. Well, always. There's a lot of stuff floating around with the state legislature, with the uh, with the new pronouns, with the uh, with the. I mean, we got the Heritage Foundation coming up in hour number three. It's going to be pretty awesome. And if you don't like what we have going on, take a step to the south because Oklahoma's got a ton going on right now. Well, yeah. Oh, did you hear that? By the way, KSL Channel Five down in Oklahoma, they recorded this, and the band apparently has plenty of funding for the band because they were pretty good down there for the education system. But did you hear them yesterday? No, go ahead. At the state capitol, baby, teachers, parents, children, and the high school bands joining together because they're angry and what? beautiful right there they're angry they're ready to roll baby we got spirit yes we do you can too <laughs> there it is that was a hat tip to ksl uh, channel 5 tv down in oklahoma for recording that one as yes the teachers parents and the band apparently they got plenty of money because they sounded pretty good and they did that on a whim how would you like to be governor mary fallon right now no, you know what? Uh, they already signed a salary increase last week, so the governor should be pretty happy about that. And I hope that they all stand firm and say, yeah, you know what? There's better ways to do this. Well, they signed one, and then they signed a supplemental one on top of it. So, I mean... I don't know what else they want. <sighs> and, of course, like usual, it's gone from uh, just the salaries of the teachers to, oh, look, now there's leaks in the roof of the buildings, and there's you know not enough classroom books, and so on and so forth. So now we need funding for all of this. So not only should we raise the salaries of the teachers that started this, but now it's grown to let's get more because we're probably getting to them. I've been following it as best I can because I have to shoot a couple of newscasts down Oklahoma way every morning. And the, the thing of it is, is that they've got Republican lawmakers that they actually, the, the educators won these lawmakers over. They, they had these guys in their corner voting for appropriations to further fund the schools. And now the same lawmakers that they had won over are saying, you know, I'm done with you guys. I you know, I I voted for the appropriations and now I see the way you're acting and now I'm done I'm out. It's so. gotten a little I I I posed the question yesterday on the the vision or the the face of the teacher. I mean, the, come on, the teacher is what is the mentor to our children. We send our children to the teacher for six, seven, eight hours a day to be able to educate them, to be the mentor, to lead them, to teach them, to encourage them. And these are the ones where uh, we've even heard the cases of them getting a little violent, blocking legislators from coming to their office, staffers getting injured. They actually took some leave of absence off for a couple of days because now the teachers are getting a little rambunctious. And of course, now they're really fired up because, I mean, heck, now we know. Oh, how upset and frustrated they actually are. So now, baby, we can actually change this. Well, and unfortunately, the main source, uh, the main sources of the news that we're going to get out of Oklahoma is going to be the bleeding heart left. That's all so we get. So it's it's gonna it's gonna have the spin on it and everything else. Um, anyway, you yes. know what I I got to tell people. Oh, hold about on. oh hold on here hold on uh, I I mean we are walking into the voice of reason I am your political therapist and that's yes. what I'm here for I'm going to sit back I have not I don't have my pipe with me I could be smoking my pipe I just need to share Andy I've I've had a lot bottled what's, up lately what's, what's on your mind my friend well this influenza B thing okay it's a terrible one I was minding my own business about twelve days ago or so. And I opened the door, and influenza. Mm. And that's, a, that's a brutal one. At first I thought, maybe it was just too much time spent landscaping out in the front yard. You know, not as young as I once was. Slinging that cedar mulch around in 10-pound bags and things like that. Mm -hmm. But then it hit me, like a freight train. Yeah. And I finally, I gave in last Friday, and I went to the doctor. And the doctor said, Mr. Everett, I don't know how to give you this news, but I'm going to give it to you straight. I said, that's the way I like it, Doc. Bring it on. Straight news. There you go. It says, you've tested positive for influenza B. Oh, that's a brutal one there. 
I tried all my life to make the A honor roll, and I couldn't even do it as a flu victim. Mm. So, off to the pharmacy it was. Promethazine, they said for the cough. Albuterol for the tightness of chest. Tamiflu. But we have to tell you, it may not work. Because it usually works best within the 72-hour window of the onset of symptoms. Uh. So I said to myself, self, we'll give it hell. Well, we do what we can. Already, we're starting to see the symptoms of Trumpism happen in the country with the virus B happening. Because it was probably led on by uh, high stress by Donald Trump starting a trade war with China. It hadn't started at that point, oh, and technically, that's... it still hasn't. Ooh, see, there you go. So there I went to go. bed so... Friday night, and I woke up Saturday morning, and something had changed. So I went back to the doctor. He says, you're right. Something has changed. You now have a sinus infection. Oh, fantastic. See? So here's 10 days worth of clindamycin. Ah. Now, between the Tamiflu and the clindamycin... You may develop a side effect that we refer to as the South Dakota Quick Step. That's right, Richard Everett. <laughs> Don't sneeze or laugh too hard in public, because it could be very embarrassing. Ah, fantastic, right there. So, where all this leads me to is I've had a lot of time to think lately. Mm -hmm. And with this time on my hands, I've thought about the necessity that our president sees in sending troops to our southern border to defend against the immigration of illegals. And I thought, you know these snowflakes, these left-wing crybaby snowflake type people. That I know have that's a trigger word right there, though. Nothing Let's... better to do than complain. Let's arm them. Let's Ooh. let them know that every immigrant they take out trying to cross our border somewhere on them is going to have a joint attached to their body. Mm. And so let's arm them with Tide Pods and condoms used as slingshots to take out these illegals <laughs> as they try to cross our border, thus freeing up our National Guard to do better things. Ooh, see, there you go. And that could probably work. Now, as long as they don't snort the condom or they eat the Tide Pod, it's it's kind of like those where I grew up on the farm and we had the raspberries and the, and the parents always gave us the bucket and said, go get the raspberries. And we come back covered with our hands and mouth. Your mouths. hands would and, be and the, red. And yeah, Your but shirt would bucket, be red. And, and it's one of those situations where if you give that to them and say, go you know, go out and be free and do your thing, they'll probably come back and see, like, we didn't find any, <laughs> but we're out of condoms and Tide Pods. Can we get some more, please? So that was my philosophical thoughts. I like that. Of the morning. There you go. How we could help our president. Well, the therapist uh, reason here admits that the uh, the multiple medications and the sinus infection and the virus beat has really led you to have a breakthrough in your life. And I think this is really a positive, constructive piece to move us into the next step here. So I'm very proud of you. All right. I got to go back to work on real news. I guess we better talk about something substantial here in The Voice of Reason, too. <laughs> got to take a break. This is The Voice of Reason. This is The Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier. minutes to the top of the hour. Welcome back into The Voice of Reason making it happen today on a Thursday. Great to have you along. The Facebook Live feed is up and rolling today as well. If you want to check that out, you're more than welcome to do so. Leave a comment, ask a question, share it, like it, whatever you want to do. Let's break that mold of the nice lines and boundaries and walls that Facebook has put up on social media so that way it's not uh, out there as much as we potentially like it to be. Let's blow the progressive agenda right off the map. What do you say? 316-721-8255. Let me tell you what. I want to stand up and I want to march. I think we should march. We should probably start a voice of reason march. Probably this weekend. We should probably do it because I am angry. I am frustrated. I am done. I think that we need to ban animal rights activists. 
That's what I think. We should probably sign legislation that say that if you are uh, in the belief of an animal rights activist where you're a vegan because you don't want to harm the animal, if you are an, an extreme animal rights activist, we probably need to ban you. We probably need to. Why? Because look what happened. There was a shooting in San Bruno, California of an animal rights activist who was terribly upset of YouTube censoring her with her videos online. And she went in there and she ended up shooting the place, wounding three people, one of them critically, and then turning the gun on herself. Animal rights activism has led to mental instability, and therefore we need to ban all animal rights activists in the nation. That's probably what we should do. So ladies and gentlemen, we need to probably march, we need to rally together, we need to hold some signs, and we need to go out into the public probably this weekend, go to the side of the street, probably just find a way to block uh, Kellogg to some degree, maybe at night or something when there's less traffic. We need to block them, we need to stand firm, and we need to say that we want to ban animal rights activists. I am going to speak, and I am going to not let up to our legislators until they sign legislation because they have failed us Ladies and gentlemen, they have failed us for the fact that there are animal rights activists allowing themselves to cause harm to others and uh, more so than actual animals because they care about the animals more than they do the humans. So they are angry and we are angry and we're going to stand up and we're going to march. Does that sound like anything coherent came out of that last 30 seconds of the show? No, it's stupid. It's the same with what's happening with this March for Our Lives, wanting to ban guns wanting to try and regulate firearms even more so, wanting to ban AR-15s, wanting to ban semi-automatic rifles, wanting to ban this, wanting to to do additional background checks, wanting to go through the fixed nicks, wanting to do all of these different things because the gun is the problem, right? The gun is the issue, the gun's the problem, and therefore we need to ban that just like we need to ban animal rights actors. I think we should start this. Why is the media not blowing up? Why has there not been a march in San Bruno, California, after that shooting to protect workers at public venues from shootings. Why has there not been a movement? Why has there not been a march? Oh, that's right. Because it was a progressive with their ideology on animal rights activism. Oh, that's right. They don't like to to express the idea that she was a Middle Eastern woman from Iran. Now, that doesn't make one bit of difference to us. We don't really care what skin color they are or their nationality. It makes no difference to us in any way, shape, or form that her name was Nassam, but I don't even know how to pronounce it, Agdam. I don't care. And they usually only care if it's a white person. Then, of course, it'd still be all over the media where it was a disgruntled white conservative who had a bunch of guns and went in and started shooting a place up. And therefore, that's another reason why we need to ban guns. But the fact that it was a progressive... It was an animal rights activist. Oh, yeah, and she attacked a large corporation who was trying to censor her and her progressive movement. That probably led to saying, eh, it's a little bit more justified, right? The progressives kind of all tied up in knots on this one. They don't know how to respond, and it's kind of faded out of the media. How long was it in the media after the Florida shooter? How long was it in the media for the, uh, it's a, uh, where was it, the Maryland shooter? How long was it in the media for the Texas shooter until they found out, of course, that the good guy actually stopped him with an AR-15 down in Texas at the church where he pulled it out of the, the back of his truck and he chased him down and shot him. How long were all of these other shootings in the media and how long did it take for them to rally? How long did it take for all the students around this area along with the entire nation to walk out of class in a uh, memorial for these 17 students that died in Florida to march and to organize this massive national March for Our Lives movement to say we need to ban guns, we're going to put the Second Amendment on the ballot, and we're going to start repealing gun rights left and right? How long did it take for that? Where's that activism for the victims of the San Bruno shooting by an animal rights activist and a progressive? Where was that? Where is it? I haven't seen it. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, we need to start rising up because we're sick and tired of shootings in our society, and we need to rise up and we need to ban animal rights activism because that led to the anger and the hate of the censoring by a large evil corporation on YouTube that is that disallowed her to be able to post the videos that she wanted to post, and therefore she was justified in that shooting, and we should never talk about it again, right? 316-721-8255. Let's go to the phones here. Shelby, good morning. What's your name? Hey, Andy, it's Pam. Pam, how are you today? Well, I'm just going to say, the thing that was missing in all these that you were mentioning is 
they didn't take the kids out of school and have the high school band there. Oh, that's true. That's true. We probably need to play the song again. We're not going to. We probably need to play this so. again because we are. We're not going to take it any longer. Animal rights activism uh, has led to mass shootings in the country. Exactly. <laughs> I, I really think we need to come on, Pam. Sing it with me here. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> There we are. Now we can officially be angry enough that we can make our statement. We can let people know exactly how we feel, and we can do something about it. There we go. I think we need to do this. Now, here's a question for you. There's a March for Our Lives movement this weekend here in Wichita. Uh, Many activists actually wanting to do this for a nationwide town hall project, probably hosted by CNN and put on by CNN. Uh, so the March for Our Lives is actually going to happen this weekend, not during a school day, which is a little bit surprising, but it is going to happen this weekend. And they say that they have invited all of the elected officials and candidates for the 4th Congressional District to show up okay. to this March for Our Lives. So that way they can ask questions and we can ask questions. And then it's going to be held, by the way, at 2 p.m. on Saturday at the Evergreen Branch Library. But <laughs> here's here's how organized they are for the organizers of the March for Our Lives. But if the location may change, depending on how many people actually show up. Okay. So if you have a large amount of people, then we'll just herd you over to another venue that's going to be a little bit bigger. Uh, what do you think? I think I'm, I'm thinking of an under-over game for about 10 people showing up to this. Well, that's what I'm hoping. About you know, 10 people, yeah. Now we've, now we've got a great big commercial uh, that I find fascinating that... It's automobile accidents that kill all these kids from age 2 to 13. Mm, see, it is the true. leading. Th- but, you know, I, I've never understood. We have never once asked to ban automobiles. Yeah, and now not only should we not only try and fight to ban automobiles, but we should probably uh, t- we should probably regulate who's allowed to get the driver's license a little bit more stringent, do a background check on your driver's yep. license, and then we should go after the corporation because the corporation of the manufacturing companies are actually making profits off of building the automobiles. Absolutely. And we should probably shut them down, too, just the way they've tried to go after the manufacturers of gun dealers. And then the importers. You ah, know, see the and, importers, uh, too. Yeah, they're a bunch of oh, racists yeah. and bigots. They really don't care about us. <laughs> <at all. laughs> Pam, I love it. I appreciate it. we got to wrap up hour number two. All righty, but there we go. I mean, we should probably ban uh, ban vehicles. We should ban animal rights activists. We should probably uh, do a, a, a three-day waiting period to get your driver's license after the test and after the background check. Then maybe you can get the driver's license. We should probably go after the manufacturer. And, oh, by the way, I don't like animal rights activists because they create mass shootings in California. Hour number three coming up when we talk, uh, when we come back. Genevieve Wood with the Heritage Foundation. She'll be joining us. Lots to touch on there as well. This is The Voice of Reason. Stay tuned. It's time for Reason. If you can put it on the ballot and if you can get 51% of naive, ignorant individuals to not understand the purpose of the Second Amendment, to not understand the purpose of shooting a gun, to not understand the role of what having a gun or a militia is all about, to understand what, to understand the background check process. You don't understand because you've never done it. To have that much of a voice, it is the blind leading the blind. This is the Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier. Then I'll get on my knees and pray. Live out of the heart of the nation here in Wichita, Kansas, on the Big Talker, 1480 on the AM side, 102.5 on the FM side, KQAM simulcasting on KGPT TV. Welcome aboard. It is a Thursday. The pre Friday celebration has begun eight minutes past the hour. Great to have you along today. You see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there, my friends. Hang tight. I know. We're still recovering from maybe all the turkey and or the ham or whatever you eat on Easter last weekend. Maybe you had an extended weekend. Does not matter. Now you see the light at the end of the tunnel for this one, my friends. Welcome in. 316-721-8255. 316-721-TALK. If you want to join into the program, the Facebook Live feed is up and rolling as well. You can leave a comment, ask a question, say good morning, call me a jerk. I don't really care what you'd like to do. Like it, share it. Let's blow this puppy up, baby. I'm really excited to have, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. We've been kind of tongue-in-cheek, had a little fun in the last hour, and we'll continue to do so as we like to do because we're just sarcastic jerks sometimes on this show, but that's okay. Uh, But this hour, I want to shift gears a little bit, and on the phone with us, I'm really excited to talk about the federal side 
the Trump administration, the agenda of conservatism, which is what we're all about. And she's uh, she's going to be talking a little bit about that and more. She is the senior communications advisor for the Daily Signal, along with the Heritage Foundation. She is Genevieve Wood on the show with us. Good morning. How are you today? Good morning, Andy. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate that. First off, I know most uh, most of the listeners and most of the conservatives around the area, I mean, are very familiar with the Heritage Foundation. I've been a very big fan for a very long time, especially working with with the organization in the in college during the college Republican years that I had back when. But talk about the Heritage Foundation and what's uh, what you guys have been doing and what's the latest in Washington, D.C.? Well, as we were saying right before the show, Andy, it's it's always a busy time. Congress is not here right now, so they're still in their Easter or spring recess. Uh, so the country's safe for another week or so <laughs> before they can do more laws and damage. But uh, it's you know it's been a very it's been a very busy uh, well it's been very busy since the Trump administration got to town. Uh, you know we've been around since 1973, but I will say that those who have followed. A government, whether it's Congress and the presidencies and different administrations, say this is one of the most activist in a good way administrations that they have seen in a very, very long time in terms of trying very hard every day to do good things. And within the law, unlike President Obama, who when he couldn't get Congress to do what he would want, would want them to do, he would just write his own regulations and get agencies sure. to put in rules and the like that he wanted on his own. Uh, they're doing every they can, everything they can within their executive power uh, to get things back on track and to fulfill, I think, many of the promises that he made on the campaign trail. Uh, we've been measuring those successes and where, where we're still falling short. But I will tell you, we did a, a survey of, of the first year and a half of his, of his administration, and he's done 64% of the recommendations that we as an institution made wow. covering everything from environmental regulation policy to budget to health care to national defense, kind of covering the gamut. There's a lot of work to be done. Don't, don't get me wrong, but they've been fulfilling a lot of the promises that they made. You know what? And we need to hear that type of news because we don't hear that in the mainstream media. We don't hear about how successful we are being, uh, even from the Republican side. I mean, when Mitch McConnell came out last year and said, well, it was a really successful year. We we got a Supreme Court justice in and we got the tax cut in with a, with a partial repeal of Obamacare in that bill. And those two items last year, that was a really successful year. And to conservatives on the, on the front, especially like out here in Kansas, we're sitting back saying, wait a second, uh, we That's have it? a long ways to go. That's it. What are we doing up there? Uh, we talked with Corey Lewandowski when they came out with their book, Let Trump Be Trump, on the show, and he had mentioned how frustrated that even with what he has been able to do, how frustrated President Trump has been because of how many times he's had his, high, his hands tied and he couldn't actually get the agendas done that we needed to. So it is encouraging to hear that we're actually seeing some kind of progress in D.C., well, well, there is. I mean, a lot of it, I would say, is not necessarily behind the scenes, but a lot of it is rolling back regulations that the previous administration and others, frankly, have put into place. I mean, I would say probably the Environmental Protection Agency and a lot of things you see in the energy and, uh, energy arena are the specific areas where you've seen a lot of rollback on regulations, which, in addition to passing the tax cuts, is one of the reasons you see the economy and jobs coming back into play. But listen, there's no doubt Congress is still the stumbling block. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's only so much the executive, you know, we have three branches of government. Uh, The president is not king. He can't just go around and make rules and and make laws, even though President Obama tried to do that at times. There's things he needs Congress to do. Uh, And I will say one of the the failures very recently uh, was the huge budget that was just passed, the big omnibus bill that was passed. Uh, That was a, a disaster by many respects. And the reason it occurred is because Republicans got everything they wanted, Democrats got everything they wanted, and that's when you end up with these trillion-dollar omnibus bills. Uh, there's, you know, there, there's some talk right now, I think a good reason uh, being they've had a lot of pushback from the conservative grassroots who were extremely unhappy with that bill. Mm-hmm. And so now they're looking at, could we possibly go back and rescind some of that spending? That does not take a supermajority. That can just be a 50-plus-1 in the Senate. Uh, so there's no reason that if Republicans – you know, they've got those votes right now that they can't do that. So when they get back from Easter, I would encourage your listeners, uh, if they are upset about the omnibus bill that recently passed, they let their members know, we want you to go back and look at that and take out the stuff we don't need in Boy, it. Absolutely. I didn't know that they could even try and do that. So that's really encouraging news on that front, because you're right, we got a lot of pushback. I mean, our legislators here, are both of our senators, our four congressmen here in Kansas ended up voting for it, and there were a lot of people that were unhappy. Now, I tried to, I always try to put the positive light on that, and I like the fact that we uh, I really think we need to be focused on the appropriations process when we come back, because we have a huge opportunity here 
to be able to do to actually look at reform the budget, go through the 12 uh, different types of appropriations and really have a solid bill for the next couple of years. Is that something that we should really start focusing on as well? Well, definitely. I mean, that would be called regular order, <laughs> where you go, you know, which is a, a can, can be a good thing. You're right. They should be going through the the, through the appropriation process. Sure. They haven't been doing that, and that's why it all gets rolled up into these one big kind of, you know, throw everything in the kitchen sink kind of bills. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to hide excessive spending in those things. And it, and it also, you know, Congress always acts when they're on a deadline. They act like they don't like it, but I think actually they really do. Because then they can say things like they just did it with this last spending measure. Well, we've got to fund the military. We've got to give them what they need. Right. And that's very true. And it's, it's one reason many Republicans, many conservatives, you know, took the hard gulp and said, okay, we'll be for this. Because they knew our military needed that funding. But we shouldn't be in that kind of, do, you know, do or die situation. Uh, and frankly, again, Republicans are in Congress. They have to be doing a better job. Oh, for sure. I mean, we definitely do. What's What's been your take on and with the Heritage Foundation's view on the – everybody talks about the, the mass panic that happens with the turnaround in the administration, the different nominees that Trump picks, and then letting somebody go and hiring somebody new. Uh, to me, it's just the business owner that's not seeing the productivity that he wants to see so he gets the right person in there. I have zero problem with it, but apparently there are some people that see that feel like all these different picks and the transitions – I mean, we're very proud of Mike Pompeo for being, being from right here – yeah. In the Wichita area, going from the congressional seat to the CIA, now being Secretary of State. I mean, we're very proud of that, but a lot of people are very up and have their guard up about all these transitions and turnarounds that we're seeing. Well, I mean, you know, Washington's not used to, to accountability. Uh, it's, it's not often used to, say, you know, really making sure are we doing what we said we were going to do, and if not, are we making changes to get in the right track to get there? And I think that's exactly what that's what business does, right? You've got a bottom line, you've got shareholders, you, you're looking at the books every month to see what are we doing, what do we need to change? And I think that's what he's doing. And sometimes that means you change personnel. Uh, and look, again, I think the president currently is beginning to get around him even more the people that he probably, you know, had he known Washington even better, might have been picking in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think you're seeing more and more of his team coming in and the solidifying of his team as a, you know, and and some of the folks who were, you know, part of the establishment to a certain extent or pushed by that are no longer there. Um, But I, I don't. I don't think there's any reason to, to to be concerned that oh well we've got new cabinet secretaries or he's taking somebody out of this job <laughs> and putting a new person in. If you're trying to get better results, sometimes that's what you have to do. Well, sure, you're absolutely right. And a lot of these picks, I mean, have been very consistent that we haven't heard of. But I mean, uh, being big agriculture area here, Sonny Purdue, Secretary of Agriculture, has been able to start getting uh, start getting rid of the water bills and the water rules that we tried to put in place under Obama. We've had Betsy DeVos with the Department of Education start repealing o- Common Core education. I mean, we've seen a lot of these things that the media surprisingly not surprisingly actually doesn't well, yeah, talk they, about. they only right they i mean you you i don't even know the last time they talked about purdue they only talk about the positions right that, where there might be a change but they they zero in and focus on that to make it look as though there's all this uproar and upheaval within the administration when that just is not accurate reporting mm-hmm. at all you said 64 percent of the agenda that or the guidelines that the heritage foundation has been able to put out the trump administration has even either been able to do or work on at least to start getting better by this time during the reagan's first year only 49 percent was actually being yeah, done. So we're actually, yeah we're actually seeing a little bit more progress there do you think that's going to help with this election come for the midterms at the end of this year or are you guys concerned about maybe a blue wave that's that's trying to take hold in the nation right now well i mean i think everybody i mean if you look at history you realize that party in power usually lose the seats in this term. So I think people are concerned because I will tell you, as hard as it is right now, even with the Congress that the president has, it will be far harder if Nancy Pelosi is, Pelosi is Speaker of the House, if Democrats were to take control. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that would be... When you look at things, like, for example, like rescinding budget measures, going forward again on health care, there's a lot of things that will completely be stalled out. The final two years of his administration would be nothing but preparing for 2020 on the Democratic side. I mean, their goal would be nothing at all to happen in Congress because they wouldn't want to give him any wins whatsoever. Sure. Uh, so I think, look, if people, you know, I'm sure they could be disappointed saying, well, I'm, we're not getting everything that we want. A part of that is, you know, Congress isn't as good as it should be, but another <laughs> part of that is <laughs> it takes time. Sure. And I would encourage people to, you know, make sure that they turn out in November. Don't let uh, the left take the streams again. No, that's very true. A couple questions left for you. I know that you're short on time. Genevieve Wood with the Heritage Foundation and with the Daily Signal. Uh, your thoughts on the the regulatory matters that we have. What's the next step? 
that Trump can do or the big focus that we should have to really rally a lot of the base that may be upset about the last omnibus bill, that may be upset with the way Trump's handled certain things or the tweets or whatever is on their mind, maybe some of the never Trumpers that I don't know if we can ever get on board. But what could we... <laughs> yeah, some people are unconvincible. Uh, some people are unconvincible. No matter what you do, it's never good enough, uh, which I understand to a degree, but yet I don't understand it. But uh, what could Trump do or what could be the next focus to really rally them? Would it be funding the wall and seeing the wall being built could it be the official final repeal of Obamacare? I mean, what should we really focus on in the next few months? Well, I think you've just named a couple of them. And look, I mean, the president is sending the National Guard to the border now. I think this recent scenario that we've seen when it comes to immigration policy is a very good example of people saying the president is trying to do what he promised the American people he would do. He can't go build the wall by himself. He can't appropriate the money to do it. Congress has to do that. But where he can do something, such as send the Guard in and say, we will protect our border, he's doing it. And I think I do think people see that. I also think people see that Mexico realized, you know what, America has said that they're not going to let people in. They're sending troops to the border. Uh, maybe we need to do our part here. And they're actually have disbanded the caravan and are turning those folks around. So that's not something we've seen Mexico do in the past. They've, they've acted like, well, these folks are just walking <laughs> across our land and headed to the U.S., and we're doing nothing to stop it. This time, Mexican officials decided we need to do something to actually stop it. So I think that's where they're seeing the U.S. is serious. They have a president who's serious. Uh, so that's the kind of thing on immigration I think we'll see continue to play out uh, over the course of the summer. And then when it comes to Obamacare, one of the silver linings out of the omnibus bill that was passed was that they did not fund Obamacare. They did not say we're going to put money in to pay off insurance companies to keep this thing afloat. That is a very good thing wow. because... It can't stay afloat unless we keep putting more money into it, which means Congress is going to be forced to deal with that issue. And that's a good thing because it gives us a chance to go back not only on the repeal, but the actual replace. I love it. I, I'm so glad that that is in there. I know that there was a debate about the, the Planned Parenthood portion of that as well, which was up for debate on some aspects as well. I really like the fact that I was not aware of that we could potentially see some of a retraction on parts of that omnibus bill, which I think... I mean, but, but, you know, but, Andy, that'll only happen if people can, you know, because there politicians go home, they, they get an earful, and that, that motivates them for a while. Sure. But when they get back to D.C., they need to keep hearing it. So exactly. uh, to keep the pressure on, like, you guys, we want to see things rescinded. We want to see those numbers come down. Well, and I think so, because the, the last question I wanted to ask was, what, what can we do here in the Kansas area to try and make our voice heard for that? But if that's an opportunity where we can just harp on them and make sure that they're very well aware that we want a lot of that spending cut out of that and that we need a little bit of a retraction here, then maybe we can see some progress on this. Uh, that's exactly what I would encourage folks to do. They're at home right now. They'll be there for the rest of this week. They're back in D.C. next week. Uh, just stay on them. I mean, the, the, you know, keep the pressure on because that's what makes folks up here move. There it is. Genevieve Wood with the Heritage Foundation, Senior Communications Advisor. Uh, we uh, Thank you so much for coming on the show. We thank love what you, you guys Andy. do. Keep up the fight. We'd love to get you guys back on again soon. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure. 21 minutes past the hour. we got to take a break. We'll open up lines to you. Open lines for the last rest of the show. This is The Voice of Reason. Stay here. The Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier on The Big Talker KQAM. It's up to you and I, ladies and gentlemen. We have a long ways to go when it comes to the advancement of conservatism, the fight that we have against the progressives, and being able to retain and elect Republicans and conservatives in government so we can advance the right agenda. Welcome back in 316-721-8255. She's right. Genevieve Wood, thanks again from the Heritage Foundation. I love that organization. Absolutely phenomenal as they try to advance conservatism on a normal basis and working with the Trump administration. Can you imagine? 65% of the guidelines from the Heritage Foundation that they've requested as a conservative think tank. Now, they're not bullying anybody. They're not forcing anybody. They're just saying, this is what we'd like to see as a conservative group. This is the way that we advance conservatism. And Trump, 65% either done or working on with that guideline, started the process, getting it rolling. He's more conservative than Ronald. He's been more, uh, he's been more uh, accomplished. He's been more active. He's been more engaged than even Ronald Reagan, and he's kind of the conservative icon, is he not? We're working. Now, we have the quote-unquote blue wave coming. I think that it's not going to happen. 
We've talked to many individuals that don't think it's going to happen. And looking at some of the results of the latest elections, it's really not that big of a blue wave because there is such a fringe. Look, she's right in the sense that usually the party that's in the power of the majority at the time in a midterm election, then we see the tra- we see the pendulum go the other way and we end up losing that majority in Congress. Then we see the stalemate that happens and then more negotiations and more compromises and bad things happen. And then we start seeing negativity happen. And we don't want to see that this year. If we can hang on, if we can hang on to the majority in both chambers and we can still have the Republican Republican presidency, imagine what we can do for the next few years. Imagine what we can do. This is going to be insane. There was a, a piece of negativity that came out, according to The Hill. Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin uh, ended up making a comment after the uh, the latest special election they had for a Supreme Court justice in the state, and the progressive liberal judge Rebecca Dallet overcame the conservative judge Michael Scrinock, and that one done and over, and the liberal progressive judge being able to advance a progressive agenda on the courts there in, in the state of Wisconsin. That one's a purple state. It's kind of an up-in-the-air state. We cannot allow that to happen around the rest of the nation, and especially with the federal elected seats. So many seats, by the way, this election are going to be up for people that who are retired or people who are just bowing out or people who don't want to do it anymore or people who are going to be dethroned. It's going to be an interesting election. We need to find a way to rally the Republicans nationwide, rally the conservatives nationwide for us to actually have the turnout. And if we can do something drastic by rescinding part of the omnibus bill when they, as soon as they come back next week, or if they're able to maybe repeal Obamacare fully, or if they're able to fully build the wall or get a huge number of the National Guard to go and take care of the southern border, if we do something drastic like that, that will re-rally the base that wants to see productivity, and Donald Trump and the Republicans will prevail in this next election. Republicans and Democrats accountable. This is the Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier. Uh, there it is. Welcome back into it. Wrapping up the show today. 36 minutes past the hour. Welcome aboard. We love having you here. 316-721-8255. 316-721-TALK. It's open line. Steve, for the last half hour of the program, what's on your mind? We have opportunities, ladies and gentlemen. You ever heard the, and this goes into life lessons as well, but you ever heard the metaphor of, you know, the it's a, the caterpillar that turns into the cocoon and then it comes into the butterfly and it's this big, beautiful butterfly. If it gets that far, and that's the whole purpose of us growing as life. You remember those stories? And I mentioned this before, but I love hearing the tales and the stories of Native Americans because that's how they taught lessons, life lessons. That's how they taught them from generation to generation was they told the story about the animal and the hunt and the extreme weather conditions or the hurting, running with the pack or the the struggles that we go through as life. And as the caterpillar turns into the cocoon, if you actually break open the cocoon and you let it out easy, then it turns into a very ugly thing because it did not have the time to be able to grow into the butterfly. If you allow it to suffer and struggle to go through, then it becomes into the beautiful butterfly, and then we have what we have with butterflies. And that's really the way that we need to look about this in some ways in politics as well. Obamacare, we have taken some great strides in order to fix things. Obamacare, we went down the wrong path. Barack Obama put us down that wrong path when we signed Obamacare. Uh, And, of course, we've already talked about that with the premiums, with the deductibles, with the price, with the coverage, with the Medicaid expansion, with the all over the country. And it's been insanity, absolutely insanity. It's been way too expensive. We read the story in the first hour about how close to 40 percent of individuals 45 to the age 59 or 60 do not go to the doctor when they need to. They have medical ailments and they do not go. Why? Because it costs too much. It's too expensive, and that's a problem, and they blame it on the fact that we haven't gone far enough when the fact is we went way too far. We went way too far. Now imagine this now. Now we have this system, and instead of actually going back or reverting to what we used to have beforehand or just getting the government out of it completely, we've kind of gone halfway that way, but we're in the growing pains right now, and now we're starting to see premiums and stuff. We're seeing the states have to cover this. Why? Because the last omnibus bill, it's good news that we defunded Obamacare. 
as we talked with Genevieve uh, Wood from the Heritage Foundation. Yeah, in that omnibus bill, one of those silver linings, one of the nice pieces in that was the fact that there was no funding for Obamacare in this omnibus bill in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't there. We didn't defund it and cut it out. We just said, eh, you're not getting appropriated any money. Which means now what? Instead of actually canceling the entire program, the program's still there, but now the the money has fallen back onto the states. And it's funny because what did we say was going to happen when Donald Trump got into office and the Republicans were going to begin repealing Obamacare, that if any of the states, including the state of Kansas, wanted to expand their Medicaid program in order to receive more grants and money from the federal government, that that's an asinine stupid thing to do because the federal government would not have to fund that expansion of our health care programs at the state level. We called it. We knew that was going to happen. According to ModernHealthCare.com, this week's Congress left states holding the bat, uh, holding the baton in a lonely sprint to the curb for 2019 Obamacare premiums with just a couple months away to get creative legislation. After opposing Republican efforts to expand federal abortion funding prohibition to the Affordable Health Care Act, cost-sharing reduction payments and other measures, the Senate Democrats opposed the GOP-led stabilization package with its funding for the, the continuing resolutions and a $30 billion reinsurance pool. The Republicans wanted to put the reinsurance pool back into the health care program, wanted to refund Obamacare, and the Democrats opposed it, which was good. I don't know why we're reversed and backwards on that one. But now, guess what? Now the states are left holding the bill. The state. Now, if you remember the arguments for the expansion of Medicaid in the state of Kansas, what did they say? They said that we were losing out on money. We were losing money. We were missing money because as long as we expand it, then the federal government's going to give us money, and therefore we can keep the rural hospitals open, which was a ridiculous, absurd comment anyways, that we were going to get more money, that we were going to be able to take care of these people, and it was going to be fantastic with our expansion of Medicaid. That was their arguments. And now look what's happening. We're not funding Obamacare. We're not funding at the federal level. We are starting to go the other way, which is a good thing. But there's going to be some growing pains in here. And one of the growing pains that we are going to see when it comes to the defunding of Obamacare is now all of these states that wanted to expand their health care programs, wanted to uh, expand their Medicaid program, wanted to get the subsidies and get the grants from the federal government. Now they're left with the bill and they're saying, oh, gee, why would you put us in that position? We knew it was coming, which is why we fought it, and we fought it, and we fought it. And now just think about this for a second. Let's take it to the next step now. We just saw not two days ago the Kansas Democrats and the state legislature try to propose another bill wanting to expand Medicaid. Another one. Now imagine what it would cost us as a state when right now we're seeing the educational bill saying that we need close to $2 billion, And then we turn around and say, yeah, we're going to need some Medicaid expansion money as well that by all estimates that we've been able to guesstimate would be another $2 billion. We have a state budget right now of close to $9 billion as a total. Try adding $4 billion to that. We'd almost be increasing our state budget by 50% in a matter of three or four years. Just like that. $4 billion between just education and just Medicaid expansion in a $9 billion state budget already. 50% 50% growth that we would see in a two- or three-year span. How could we possibly, possibly stabilize ourselves as a state in that sense? It wouldn't happen. We knew it was coming. We called it. Thank God we were able to stop the Medicaid expansion. And shame on you progressives wanting to continue to advocate for it because we can't afford it, nor would have been a smart thing to actually have government health care in the first place. But that's not even besides the point. Not only is it not un, uh, not constitutional, not only is it completely lacking common sense, but it's unfinancially stable. We can't do it. 316-721-8255. Let's go to the phones here. Shall we line it up phone calls? Line number one. Good morning. What's your name? My name is um, Eddie, Eddie, and good I have morning. two comments. Okay. Okay. My first comment is um, something that affects me and my family is health insurance today is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. My doctor has told me it's a nightmare. The billing office has told me it's a nightmare. So, Obama, you can be really happy over that. You destroyed one of the things that you wanted to destroy in the United (laughs) States. Sure. Number two, about um, this gun laws. Are you aware, and I'm I'm positive, uh, here in Wichita, approximately 30 years ago, we had a five-day waiting period in the city of Wichita. That's not the county, that's not the state, but a five. And I do remember by purchasing a thirty-eight, 
and I did have to wait five days. Or five if you didn't days. want to wait five days, okay, this is Wichita. If you didn't want to wait five days, um, go out to Goddard, go down to Hayesville, go over to Augusta, or you can just go up the uh, 61st Street and buy one. That is insane. Why did it, why did they implement that? Was there a sure was there a reason for it? Were they just testing it out? What what was the cause? Oh, you know, they decided they were going to do something about all the shootings and et cetera like that. So <laughs> and how'd that work out? Have, it didn't because they repealed it. It didn't work, Andy. I mean, it just flat didn't work. Okay, go up in the north end and ask some thirteen year old kid if you can buy a gun and he'll sell you a gun for twenty bucks. <laughs> or or go through the um, or go through the process of getting one here in Wichita waiting five days, or drive down to 71st Street South to Hayesville and buy one, or you, your your office is located out there at, at, at May, I mean, mm-hmm. on, on Mays Road. Sure. Okay, go straight north to the city of Mays, and uh, go into the hardware store there that sold guns wow. and sold... Uh, okay, I'm only talking about handguns. I'm not talking sure. about long guns. I'm t- and, and buy one. And That's we did it. We had it here in we, we had it here in Wichita for an absolute fact, and it and it just didn't work. And finally, the city council members, um, possibly we had some new ones, looked at each other and we said, "You know what we're doing? We're just spinning our wheels. It's not working." And so they repealed it, and that's absolute fact. Unbelievable. I, I had not heard of that. I was not aware. Now, there are some states that are actually trying to do the waiting period and ban uh, automatic rifles full out, and they're getting a lot of backlash for that. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm going to be filling in for Armed American Radio tonight uh, on KQM. You can listen to that at 8 o'clock. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I was not aware of Wichita, but apparently it wasn't enacted for very long because they it seemed to be repealed pretty quickly, and we don't have that right now. Right. Andy, I don't tell you stories, and I don't tell you facts that aren't accurate. Because I myself bought a 38, uh, I bought it at Bay Singers over on Central Street, and I remember that uh, after all the paperwork and the whole nine yards, that I had to come back five days later wow. to pick up my revolver, and that's absolute fact. I bought it at Bay Singers at uh, over on uh, Central Street. Everybody knows where Bay Singers. Sure, was. I'll do on a little Central research Street. on that. Yeah, I appreciate that, Eddie. I appreciate the call, my friend. That's a great, uh, great point. Great, uh, very interesting. And like you mentioned, when it comes to the health care. The doctors don't like it. The insurance companies don't like it. The bill payers don't like it. The patients don't like it. They're running everybody through the mill like an assembly line. They're just popping out pills left and right because they don't have time to actually do the the the, the research or do the actual investigation on what's wrong with somebody. Just, oh, here you go. You got some pain. Here's some pills for you. Ah, take the edge off. That'll be a little bit. That'll be nice. We, we messed it. And just how, you know what they say, that for every shooting that happens, for every victim that's that's uh, the victim of a gun shooting or a mass shooting or a school shooting, that it's on the bl- the blood is on the hands of the NRA. You know that statement of what they're making right now with the March for Our Lives, with the protesters, with everybody wanting to ban guns right now? With that kind of statement, maybe we should say that every person that gets sick and can't afford to go to the doctor right now, that's, the, that's on the hands of Barack Obama. All of this transition of repealing his major mistake, everybody, the 40, 50 percent of individuals uh, that are anywhere from 40 years old on up to retirement who cannot afford to get their prescriptions or get less than recommended, who cannot afford to go to the doctor and get tests done, who cannot afford to get the get the duties done that they need to because it's too expensive. For everybody that expanded Medicaid, that everybody that expanded Obamacare in their states, that everybody that made these great decisions and now we're suffering from it for every person that dies, every person that's suffering on a daily basis, every person that can't afford to get their test done or go get their pills, that's on you, Barack Obama. And we're, we can play the exact same game. How about that one? It's time for conservatives to be on the offense on here instead of playing the defense and trying to defend our position sometimes. How about we actually go on the offense? and actually criticize their ideas because they're stupid. Let's go back to the phones here, shall we? Good morning. What's your name? Hey, Andy, this is Heath. What's going on, Heath? Well, people have been talking about a blue wave coming, and I think that the blue wave has already swept Kansas on the state level. And because I got a hold of our state senator, his name's Ed Berger, he's from the Hutchinson area, Mm -hmm. and we talked about the school budget and uh, the constitutional amendment and things of that nature. And basically, he said that he's not interested in talking about the constitutional amendment until the schools get funded and the uh, funding formula gets fixed sure. and things of that nature. And basically, what he told me is that he is afraid that the court will take offense if they pass the constitutional amendment first. So oh, he's basically no. scared. Oh, no. 
Oh, that's a terrible thing that they might get offended and may, they might be triggered. They may have to go in their court in, in their nice little chambers and, and have a safe space. Yeah, so <laughs> I guess basically what I would tell everybody is get on the phone and get a hold of your legislature. That's what we um, need to do. Now, the good news is with that is that, that Senate President Susan Wegel, i got to give her credit on this one and many of the Republicans where they said that they will not look at educational funding bills until they address the constitutional amendment. So they're on the right side of that. Now, Ed Berger, I don't know if you remember or not, but not last summer of 2017, but the year before that, when I broadcast up at the state fair during the election, I talked to Ed Berger, and he was a candidate at that time. And we could tell right off the bat that he was, I mean, not to trash him or anything, but he was uh, way more on the moderate side, that he wanted to fund education, he wanted to address these things, he wanted to do a lot of the agenda of what the what the moderate Republicans and many progressives in the state have been pushing for, and he deceded a conservative up there. Now, I don't know anything about the conservative prior to, but Ed Berger, he was one of those that was very much on the moderate side, so that doesn't surprise me that he doesn't want to look at the constitutional amendment and is one of those that's very afraid of actually addressing the Supreme Court's power and trying to limit them. Yeah, as far as Waggle goes, as far as Waggle goes, I think she reversed herself now, because I heard in the news this morning that they've They've dropped the conversation about the amendment until until the uh, funding uh, gets fixed and stuff. And oh, so, so now they've reversed it. So, well, that's what I heard on the news this morning. And it, and it seems like we have no legislators, very few, that have a backbone. I mean, they are so ready to surrender their power to this court. It, it is unbelievable to me that, you know, that's what the conversation I had with Berger is that, you know, regardless of where you are uh, on the money, uh, we we need to be uh, we need to have the legislature control the the, the money exactly you know well, and uh, as you know as far as Berger goes yeah he has a soft spot in his heart for education he's an ex president of college he's you know he's on capers now he's he's bringing home around ten to fourteen thousand a month from capers and you know between education funding and the capers program those those are going to be the two anchors that bury this state sure. if we don't fix them pretty quick well so that's anyway a i'll point. let you go heath i appreciate the call my friend great points and thank you for calling your legislator look i don't care what their priority is really when it comes to that whether all oh, let's address the educational funding before the amendment or the amendment before the educational funding i don't really care and just like uh, what's happened over the last week with them going back and forth on the legislation ki- d- killing it from the floor bringing it back and voting on it and passing it and then with this you need to be making the phone calls both in the House and in the Senate right now and tell them we need to have the power back in the legislature. Now, if we if we start barring the Supreme Court and we do our own formula through the legislature and they come up with still a really bad bill, then that's us to fight for that fight. But right now, one fight at a time, let's limit the power of the Supreme Court. Let's allow the legislature to create their own formula when it comes to funding because they have the power of the purse. And then let's start bickering about what kind of money we should be sinking into it. And that's the way the process needs to be. Let's take another phone call, shall we? Good morning. What's your name? Hi, Andy. This is Helen. Helen, how are you today? I'm doing just great. Good. I have a, a, a question. Okay. Um, why uh, is Mexico... Allowing these uh, twelve hundred plus, you know, uh, illegal immigrants to cross their country because <laughs> they don't uh, when, care. Well, when right, well, when and you know, remember that one military guy that you know, American that made a wrong turn and accidentally went in to Mexico and they sure. arrested him and threw him in prison. Oh, sure. <laughs> What a bunch of hypocrites. That's terrible. Oh, they really are. Now, look, they have uh, the the Mexican government for the longest time. They've cleaned themselves up some, but the the mobs have run. And I mean, their their government is so corrupt with mobs, with corruption, with drugs, with firearms, with human trafficking, with all that stuff that they try and talk tough and like they're a streamlined government and they're not involved in any of that kind of stuff. But they are very much so. And a lot of the revenue that comes into that economy into Mexico comes from illegal trades with the United States with drug trafficking and human trafficking and gun trafficking. So they may try and say like they want to keep their people there and make their country a better place, but they live and they thrive off of that. And if we build the wall and if we don't secure it and if they stop people coming in here, they would lose as a nation for the nation of Mexico and for a lot of the companies down there and for a lot of the different people, they would be losing revenue and they don't want to see that happen. So they're the ones who say they talk tough, but yet they still kind of look the other way. And that's that's really what happens. On It's scary. I mean, you get pulled over. I've heard horror stories of getting pulled over by a police officer down there in Mexico and they find your taillights out and they'll throw you in prison unless you kind of slip them some bills underneath the table there. 
That's really what happens. It's crazy. I'm not saying that it happens all the time, and I'm not saying it's the people that are just bad down there. I am saying, though, that there is a corrupt government. Because governments never get corrupt, do they? Seven minutes to the top of the hour. Appreciate the call, Helen. Got to take a break. Wrapping up the show today. This is The Voice of Reason. You're listening to The Voice of Reason with Andy Hoosier. I know it doesn't seem like it, but you and I have a louder voice than we'd like to acknowledge. Just look at David Hogg. All we got to do is make our voice heard. All we got to do is rally around a singular voice. a sing- Not a singular voice, because we're all having a voice, but a singular message. And we cry about it loud enough and long enough, and people will pay attention. You call those le- legislators at the state level, at the federal level. I did not realize that we could rescind some of that omnibus bill. Let's make that happen. What do you say? Let's talk to our legislators, and uh, let's talk to Congressman Estes. Let's talk to Congressman Roger Marshall. Let's talk to Lynn Jenkins. Let's talk to all of them. Let's talk to our two senators. Let's say, hey, you know what? Yeah, you know what? The bill, it went through. It was unfortunate. Let's start repealing and rescinding parts of it that we did not like. The stuff where... We had a little excessive spending in there. Let's make that happen. There's an opportunity. And, oh, by the way, Kansas legislators, let's worry about the constitutional amendment before we worry about the funding because that can change how the funding actually sets. You can't do one. You can't put the egg before the chicken, right? It's craziness. I know it's a wild concept, but it's kind of common sense and, oh, I don't know, reason. This is your show. It's time to speak up, speak out, speak loud, speak proud, speak the truth, and always speak some reason. That's what we're all about, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great Thursday.